All right, so we're going to get started. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, today, we're going to have uh, a rehearsal of our presentations for the American College of Cardiology scientific session presentations. And today, we'll be featuring uh, three of our uh, chief uh, cardiology fellows uh, who will be presenting uh, an outcome study and followed by two clinical cases. Uh, please, uh, if you are there at the ACC convention, make sure that you join in and uh, and applaud their presentations. Um, for the first presentation, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Sanders. Uh, Dr. Sanders uh, is a third year chief cardiology fellow. Uh, Dr. Sanders uh, has his uh, training uh, from Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, and following which uh, he underwent his residency at Rutgers and also underwent his uh, cardiovascular fellowship training at Rutgers. Um, he has, uh, uh, I was looking through his CV and I was very intrigued that he actually um, pursued uh, when he was in Geisinger uh, a genomic medicine research internship in precision uh, health center uh, at Guy Sanger. And subsequently, uh, one of the uh, things that I've seen is that he's he's got always been very interested uh, trying to be associated with research. Uh, and he has had uh, several pursuits. He's, uh, he's got several posters and uh, publications uh, he has been able to uh, amass during his three years. Uh, and we are very excited that he's going to be joining us uh, uh, in his fourth year as the uh, uh, fellow uh, in interventional uh, cardiology fellowship program. With that, uh, today he's going to present us um, uh, outcome study in interventional uh, cardiology. Uh, with that, Mark. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sengupta, for the introduction. I'll get my presentation all pulled up. Yeah, we can see them. All right, everybody, thank you for joining. Again, Dr. Sengupta, thank you for that introduction. Um, the title of the study, uh, which will be uh, featured at ACC in just a few days, uh, is Outcomes and Trends in the Use of Aspiration Thrombectomy for STEMI in the U.S. It's an analysis of the national inpatient sample. I have no disclosures. Uh, first and foremost, I want to start by thanking um, everybody involved in this project. I wouldn't have been able to uh, get anywhere without the participation of all the people uh, listed here, so I have a tremendous amount of gratitude and thanks towards them for their help um, in this project. Um, these are my objectives, and I'll jump right into it. So first thing I want to do is discuss a little bit of the background and the pathophysiology of a STEMI. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, um, but here we can see what a normal uh, coronary artery looks like, and then it'll progress to have this atherosclerotic plaque process. And then over time, um, as this plaque becomes more uh, unstable, as they call it, and it ruptures, uh, it then develops a thrombus and then occlusion of the artery, and that ultimately leads to this problem of having a STEMI, um, which you know is uh, problematic for patients and can be life-threatening. Um, and we talked about uh, thrombectomies as part of the uh, you know what we're going to be looking at in, in conjunction with the STEMI. So I just wanted to explain a little bit about about that procedure. So like I explained earlier, in the STEMI process, a thrombus occurs in the epicardial coronary arteries. So here's just a schematic showing uh, one of the main coronary arteries and some branches coming off of it. So in the conventional approach, uh, without involving thrombectomy, you would just essentially target the lesion. You would uh, use whatever wires, catheters, uh, balloons, stents, whatever you needed to kind of treat it and get the uh, uh, circulation flowing again. But if you don't rid the thrombus from the uh, vessel, you end up with a lot of um, downstream showering of the clots uh, into the microvasculature, and that has a lot of downstream consequences, both literally and figuratively. But in the, sch in the schematic at the top, uh, you can see they've introduced an aspiration catheter to essentially suck out a thrombus, which is demonstrated in this picture. And what they can do is, is then they can address the lesion in the vessel and um, not have to worry about showering that clot downstream to the microvasculature and causing all, all other kinds of complications. So that's the general idea of doing mechanical or, or aspiration thrombectomy uh, in the setting of a STEMI. Uh, a little bit more about the background. Um, large thrombus burden poses a challenge during acute STEMI management. 
Uh, PCI proves to be useful for restoration of flow to the microvasculature, like I demonstrated in that schematic earlier. However, it has consequences. The microvascular downstream uh, may uh, endure a showering of that clot. And there are also some um, studies that show that these patients also undergo higher rates of incident thrombosis and other complications of not having that uh, thrombus uh, adequately um, aspirated prior to, to treating the lesion. I apologize, my slides seem to be a little bit cut off. Um, so it seems like in the early 2000s uh, into the early 2010s, uh, there was a lot of investigation performing aspiration thrombectomy. Um, and the initial trials really tried to understand um, the benefit, the risks and benefits and the overall mortality benefit. And some of those studies like TAPAS, TACE, and TOTAL um, initially showed that there was um, an improvement in mortality in doing routine aspiration thrombectomy uh, before treating a lesion in STEMI. Uh, but then subsequent more robust studies showed that not only was there not an improvement in mortality, but there also was increasing complications like stroke being the, I think, the most concerning and, and prominent one. So I think that led to what we have now is our current guidelines for the ACC AHA, at least as of 2021, is that routine aspiration thrombectomy before primary PCI is not useful. It's a class three uh, indication. You'll see down here, if it's a bailout, sorry, I'm, uh, you can't see my, uh, okay. During bailout aspiration thrombectomy, if you're having a tough time, let's say restoring flow or getting the wires across, whatever the difficulty may be during uh, the acute event, it then becomes a 2B recommendation um, that, you know, this can be used in bailout situations. So again, it's currently not in the guidelines to routinely use aspiration thrombectomy uh, in the setting of primary PCI for STEMI, but it can be used uh, in a situation of bailout. So what we aim to do was assess how often this procedure is being performed and what are the outcomes like. In our primary endpoints, uh, we're looking at things like inpatient mortality and stroke. Um, so, uh, the way we did this was we utilized uh, the National Inpatient Sample Database um, spanning years 2009 to 2020. And what we did is we queried patients with the diagnosis of STEMI at the primary visit diagnosis who also went primary PCI at that time. And then we um, compared between patients who had STEMI and primary period PCI and then also had aspiration thrombectomy versus not having the aspiration thrombectomy. And our primary endpoints, um, again, were this inpatient mortality and stroke during that visit. We also did a pretty uh, thorough analysis of demographics, such as age, sex. We looked at a lot of their medical comorbidities, socioeconomic factors, et cetera. So this next slide is a little bit busy. I'm gonna break it down uh, on subsequent slides. I just wanna give you an overall idea on the numbers that we stumbled upon. So here's our total population broken down by sex, age, race. We also looked at things like comorbidities um, and other complications that may have arose during their uh, stay during their studies. But again, I'll break this down further. I wouldn't spend too much time on this kind of busy table, uh, table one. So in terms of our findings, we ended up with nearly 1.5 million visits over that 2009 to 2020 uh, time period with primary diagnosis of STEMI with primary PCI. About 100,000 of those patients underwent aspiration back at the time of their, at their STEMI primary PCI, which is represented here by this pie graph. Um, here's the entire population. You see this red sliver, which is about 6.7%. That represents the patients um, under, who had a STEMI who underwent aspiration thrombectomy. And then uh, interestingly over here, we have a, um, a graph that represents um, the rates over time and the percent of patients getting aspiration. And you see the first couple of years, 2009 through 2014, it stays kind of steady. And then you see in 2015, it starts to take a little bump. And then by 2016, it raises significantly and continues. And I think it's important to note that what's going on there is that in 2015 is when the ICD uh, coding system changed. So they switched from the ICD-9 to the ICD-10 coding change. So that accounts for why we saw such a difference in the percent of patients undergoing aspiration in these first couple of years. This mid-year, I think they switched in October of that year. And then why we see from 2016 through 2020 this uh, trend. 
Um, so some of our important findings. Um, so for the semi-patients who underwent aspiration thrombectomy, they had significantly more comorbid conditions. They were more likely to present with shock and cardiac arrest and were also likely, uh, more likely to undergo uh, mechanical circulatory support. And then after multivariate adjustment, there was no significant, in the rate, no significant difference in the rates of in-hospital death or stroke amongst STEMI patients who underwent aspiration thrombectomy versus those who did not. So uh, in conclusion, aspiration thrombectomy is still using a significant number of STEMI patients in the United States uh, like I showed you, nearly 7% of the population uh, that had that as a primary visit diagnosis between the years of 2009 and 2020 underwent aspiration thrombectomy. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, patients who underwent aspiration thrombectomy had more comorbidities and risk factors. However, the aspiration thrombectomy was not independently associated with in-hospital death or stroke. So I just, uh, that'll bring us to our discussion. Um, so basically, our current guidelines, like I showed you earlier, uh, it's a class three recommendation to routinely use aspiration thrombectomy in the setting of a STEMI, um, mainly because of those three major studies that I showed you, uh, TAPAS, TASTE, and TOTAL. Um, but however, we do encounter in clinical, in clinical practice, you know, this challenge of patients with a large thrombus burden. So I think this study shed some light on how many patients are actually receiving this therapy, what types of patients are receiving this therapy, how sick are they, what are their demographics, and their outcomes um, regarding uh, how they do after they get the aspiration therapy, aspiration thrombectomy. So I think this begs the question is, do we need to rethink the way we approach um, going about aspiration thrombectomy, given how, you know, the strict guidelines that we have and, um, you know, what we see from this study and everything that we've kind of gleaned from our analysis. Here are my references, and I just want to thank everybody. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, that was a succinct uh, presentation. Uh, I'm just going to open up for any questions uh, from anyone. All right. So, um, uh, Mark, I'm going to just um, ask a, a few questions um, to my understanding. So, as we know, that STEMI, uh, and I mean, the typical uh, understanding is that we have a plaque rupture and a thrombus form formation. But um, uh, last time, last uh, week, uh, or a week before that, when Dr. Bermani uh, uh, presented, so sometimes the thrombus can happen without there being a plaque rupture. Uh, as well, uh, they call it plaque erosion, uh, and and then erosion followed by thrombus formation. Obviously, the burden of thrombus is more when you have a plaque rupture. Do we do uh, systematic any IVA studies or anything in these situation, or has there been any insights into uh, the amount of? Um, uh, I mean, this may be not from your data uh, sets, but how how much do you think? Uh, uh, use of an IVUS or anything around ACS, is there in the records or, or in the databases um, to understand the pathophysiological insights around these uh, trauma and uh, burden of the thrombus formation? Uh, that's a good question, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Um, it's There's definitely studies out there about um, how to best grade the degree of thrombus, but I think a lot needs to be done in terms of determining, uh, you know, if we can do more uh, objective or intravascular imaging and assessment of the thrombus burden uh, and exactly uh, stratify exactly what we're dealing with clinically that may have a, a very tremendous impact in how we decide to approach and treat these patients. Um, so I think it may be something that's very worthwhile. I will definitely look into it um, and it's something to definitely consider. And uh, then the second question is, uh, uh, one would assume that if you unload the thrombus, the infarct size uh, would be smaller. Uh, is there any um, data to show either in form of um, uh, imaging or, or maybe electrocardiographic with biomarkers, anything to suggest that the infarct size is smaller in these people once you do the aspiration? 
So I think that the convention, the the conventional thought, or the conventional approach is that performing this asp uh, aspiration will prevent showering of the clot downstream and provide better TIMI flow and uh, revascularization beyond just the matic revasculature. So I imagine that that would, you know, influence how, um, you know, how the myocardium performs after the event. But um, I definitely have to uh, look into exactly if there is a way that it's been studied before, whether it's through biomarkers or electrocardiograms or echocardiographic or other imaging modalities. And this particular uh, work that you've done, what will it trigger you to examine and what will be the, any design that you have thought about uh, of a study that you would like to do based upon this insights? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, so I think it's important to understand um, what, how the guidelines uh, came into place and based, also, based off of what kind of landmark studies and, and, and research was done, and then try to tease out whether it's by, like you're suggesting, biomarkers or, or um, invasive hemodynamics or um, other modalities to determine, is there a way to stratify the patients that would best serve from this aspiration thrombectomy and uh, possibly you know, uh, offer them this therapy uh, and be able to kind of shy away from the, the uh, existing uh, fears or the existing worries that, that the procedure uh, has at this time. All right. Any questions from the panel? Any, uh, anyone from the audience want, wanting to ask any question? I see Dr. Marrera has joined, so um, I don't see any other inter um, any other interventional cardiology people here. Uh, as we do more and more uh, imaging study, I think, uh, Mark, what would be useful is to combine uh, some of your um, interventional procedure with the imaging as an outcome. Particularly, MRI has been used as an endpoint for clinical trials in ST elevation myocardial infarction and infarct size is a surrogate for clinical outcomes. Uh, and so if you're, you can use uh, CMR infarct size, uh, which can be done at five to seven days or two weeks, uh, it's pretty mature. Um, and, and it will be important to um, look into not only the infarct size, but also sometimes uh, you have a complex uh, phenomenon like intramyocardial hemorrhage, um, and some of these biomarkers from imaging can be used as a method to understand the success of any type of procedure. So you can have a comparison that you could do. Maybe these are some of the designs that you could do in your um, year next year when you are with us. Absolutely. That's awesome. Just think of that, uh, Mark. Um, yeah. I'm going to just add uh, the STEMI DTU study that we are doing. Do we use the uh, um, aspiration thrombectomy in our STEMI patients here? Because this is one subset we could potentially look at in our institution since we are getting imaging data on all of these patients. So, the STEMI yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm going to defer to you, Dr. Sinkup. I'm not, actually not sure uh, what the approach is to thrombectomy in that uh, STEMI DTU. I, uh, the protocol specific for STEMI DTU, um, I don't think it calls in for doing a thrombus aspiration, but uh, I will have to refer to the uh, guideline and we'll ask maybe this question to uh, the interventional team who's uh, uh, who are doing the procedures if there is uh, any specific mention of doing the thrombus aspiration or not? Good question, Yasmin. Yasmin, do you want to just add a little commentary about uh, CMR endpoints? I know that um, myocardial uh, tissue characterization in MI is pretty well developed field on in CMR. Yeah, I mean, there are some centers that still kind of routinely do MRI in patients uh, uh, post STEMI. Um, and uh, there is a large amount of data, like you had mentioned earlier, in regards to assessing myocardial hemorrhage um, using uh, T2, T2 star mapping and LGE and evidence of microvascular obstruction that we see quite common in big STEMIs, particularly um, LAD or left main STEMIs. So um, 
Um, there, there has been data out there. People used to do it routinely, but not that often. Uh, there was a there's a phenomenon called salvageable myocardium, like people used to uh, do MRI um, in in these patients um, and then uh, treat and then redo MRI to assess how much myocardium you have salvaged based on all these different techniques uh, using T1, T2, LG, etc. So um, depending on what technique we use to treat these patients, definitely. I mean, if we follow up with, a fo uh, with another imaging study, we can tell if they have made a difference or not. But what's the data out there? What's our current practice and what could be done uh, in future? Something we should definitely look into. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. All the best for your presentation. Thank you. um, Thank you. And we're going to switch guards, and I'm going to just uh, invite now Dr. Janet Kai. Uh, Dr. Kai will be um, making a case presentation. So I think they're just uh, switching over the cameras. There you go. Uh, Dr. Kai uh, came uh, to us um, after her uh, medicine training from Drexel University College of Medicine and doing uh, uh, doing her initial training there. Then she had her internal medicine. Uh, she pursued at Rutgers Robert for Johnson Medical School. Uh, she did uh, her cardiology fellowship. She's in her last year as a chief fellow. And subsequently, she's going to go and join Jefferson back to Philadelphia. Uh, so uh, Janet has worked uh, extensively and has written several manuscripts recently. And we had had the pleasure to work together on some research projects. And for today, uh, she's presenting a, a, a complex case. Uh, Janet, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sengupta, for the introduction. And uh, good evening, everyone. We'll be discussing a case of severe left ventricular assist device outflow graft obstruction that required some complex decision-making and a multidisciplinary approach. This case was a collaboration between our cardiothoracic surgery team and our advanced heart failure and transplant teams. Uh, thank you to, to Dr. Iron, and Dr. Dolnwan uh, for their help with this, this abstract. And so rates of implantation of LVADs have increased over the past decade. One of the complications patients with LVADs may experience is outflow graft obstruction. This is uncommon, but it does pose pretty severe consequences when it does occur. Mechanisms of outflow graft obstruction can include intraluminal thrombus, uh, formation, extrinsic compression, uh, as well as kinking or, or twisting of the graft itself. Uh, there is an increasing incidence of this occurring with each additional year of LVAD support, ranging from 0.6% at one year, all the way up to 9.1% at five years. So essentially, the longer patients have LVAD score, the higher their chance of developing this complication. In the setting of outflow graft obstruction, patients may present with low flow alarms and heart failure exacerbations. In these images, these were taken from the HeartMate 3 LVAD instructions for use manual that was provided directly by Thoratech. And these show the various parts of a HeartMate 3 LVAD. Uh, the outflow graft itself is made of a sealed woven polyester material and the hardware necessary attached, uh, needed to attach the graft to the pump essentially. Uh, the distal end of the graft is designed so that it can be cut uh, essentially down to a proper length uh, that then allows it to be sutured to the ascending aorta uh, essentially using a end to side anastomosis. A reinforced tube then encases the proximal portion of the graft and serves as a bend relief around that outflow graft. And this helps to prevent kinking um, and abrasion from that area. In the image on the left, we see really sort of the, the bend relief actually, um, sort of the, the white structure here. And the actual outflow graft runs through it. So it's sort of a telescope in that sense. Um, and once again, that outflow graft then runs all the way up and connects to the aorta. The polyester material of that graft itself is actually sort of porous and it allows certain components of the blood to leak out and into that space between the graft and the bend relief itself. Um, this material can then become trapped and then can lead to a collection of this proteinaceous or gelatinous substance that can then cause that extrinsic compression we were talking about. Um, the bend relief though is something that can be attached and removed uh, and reattached during the implantation procedure. 
And if necessary, uh, the outflow graft itself can be detached entirely from the pump itself, permitting pump replacement without having to do that uh, aortic anastomosis over. Uh, so with that background, we'll delve into our case a little bit. Um, the, the patient is a 54-year-old man uh, with a history of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, deep venous thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism while on Xarelto. He underwent a HeartMate 3 LVAD implant about four years prior to this presentation, and he comes in this time with recurrent low flow alarms as low as 2.5 liters per minute. He was on warfarin, had been taking it reliably, and his INR was within the target range. He had previously been listed for heart transplant as a UNO status 4, and initially during the hospital course, he was relatively stable, just on the regular floor in the hospital, uh, and so the patient was up, up, essentially upgraded to UNO you know, status two by exception for transplant. While awaiting an appropriate donor, however, he acutely decompensated, uh, developed cardiogenic shock with worsening low flows as low as 1.7 liters per minute, multi-organ failure, and required vasopressor and inotropic support. So these are some of his uh, transthoracic echo images. Um, it showed a dilated left ventricle with an end diastolic uh, diameter of about 6.5 centimeters and an already known severely reduced LV uh, ejection fraction. In the parasitical long axis, we can actually see uh, essentially the aortic valve opens with every beat. Um, and that generally is a sign uh, indicating sort of inadequate unloading of the left ventricle in individuals with LVADs. Ideally, the aortic valve should open periodically, uh, once every few beats, not with every beat. And this is uh, the coronal and sagittal views of the CTA. Um, basically, this is kind of one of the best ways to image and, and evaluate for things like outflow graft obstruction. Um, and this CTA shows that there is extensive thrombus, essentially, through that entire outflow graft with severe stenosis. Um, especially in the image on the right, you can see that there is obstruction of flow. So there's really reduced to just a, a little sliver of, of contrast kind of coming through. Uh, in these images, it can be difficult to determine whether that thrombus is internal or external, um, and external meaning sitting between the graft and the, the bend relief itself. And so while the original plan was to pursue transplant, the patient acutely decompensated and more urgent intervention is now required. The decision regarding the best next steps was complicated by that uncertain location of the thrombus itself, whether it's internal or external, as essentially the, the treatment would vary depending on that location. If the thrombus is internal, ballooning or stenting for internal thrombi by interventional cardiology is something that can be pursued, uh, though there is a pretty high risk of stroke, and there's also risk of you know, occluding the, the outflow graph at some point sort of downstream. And as this thrombus actually extended all the way to even the proximal portion of the graft, uh, there's also concern about instrumenting that graft so close to the pump itself. If the thrombus is de determined to be external, surgical evacuation and uh, relief of that obstruction could be attempted. Uh, graft exchange and repair were also considered, but keeping in mind that this patient had a history of DVT and PE even on Xarelto in the past and had developed the mural thrombus despite uh, you know, having and then uh, essentially an appropriate INR being at goal, it kind of made him really at higher risk for recurrence should we pursue uh, just the graph exchange and repair. Ultimately, the plan was to pursue surgical exploration to determine the exact location of the thrombus. If internal, there's discussion regarding placing an impella uh, for LV support as the bad is no longer you know, appropriately supporting the patient. Though this could be difficult as the patient already has that bad in place. A status upgrade would, for transplant would then be requested as well. If external, surgical evacuation would be attempted. Um, on surgical exploration via a sub approach, the alpha graft was exposed and the thrombus was determined to be external to the graft. We can see here in the images, uh, there's this yellow gelatinous substance, so maybe not the thrombus that we're, we're typically used to seeing. Um, and this was found on just instrumentation of that space between the graft and the distal bend relief using tonsil forceps. Fortunately, the thrombus was easily expressed and evacuated under pressure, and the patient had immediate improvement in LVAD flows uh, while in the OR. Now, from essentially the, the start of the surgery to um, 
the surgeons seeing that improvement of flows in their off note, they noted that, you know, it took only about 30 minutes. Uh, they were able to go through sort of a, a more minimally invasive approach uh, to the subcyphoid region. So our case involved obstruction due to thrombus, but there can be other causes such as kinking or twisting of the graft as previously mentioned. Treatment stat strategies will vary depending on the location and cause of obstruction. Approaches to treating internal thrombus include medical management with an increased INR goal, uh, percutaneous balloon angioplasty or balloon expandable stent or outflow graft replacement. For an external thrombus, surgical uh, exploration with evacuation of the thrombus should be performed. For kinking or twisting of the graft, as well as anastomotic stenosis, surgical revision or graft replacement should be pursued. A multidisciplinary discussion, including the advanced heart failure teams, uh, cardiac thoracic surgery, and interventional cardiology is necessary to determine the best next steps. In conclusion, outflow graft obstruction is an uncommon complication post LVAD implantation, but one that presents with serious consequences. As the number of LVAD implantations increase, this condition may be something we see more frequently. Uh, and we know that the longer patients have LVAD score, the more likely they are to develop this complication. This patient's case of outflow graft obstruction was noted to be particularly severe and extensive. And there was concern that it would be difficult to evacuate enough thrombus, uh, even with the surgical approach, just because of how proximal that, that clot sort of extended towards the pump. Um, fortunately for him, the thrombus was very easily removed and there was immediate improvement noted in the operating room. He was stabilized and ultimately successfully underwent a cardiac transplant. And for external thrombi, I think it is important to keep in mind that the surgical approach should really always be considered, no matter how extensive that thrombus may look, as you may be able to evacuate enough of it really to improve LVAD flows, even in that situation. Ultimately, multidisciplinary discussions are necessary as the best course of treatment for outflow graft obstruction remains unclear. These are my references. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Janet. Uh, I think I would like to just uh, say that, the, the, uh, first of all, your presentation was very nice, very lucid. And I also like the images. Uh, and luckily, you showed us uh, moving echocardiography images, so that made a difference. Uh, you may or may not be able to do that on the poster, but. Uh, uh, it was it was good. I also liked your uh, CT image, which was very clearly highlighting the thrombus. I think the images are so so striking that uh, you might want to pursue uh, publications. Um, I just want to open up uh, if anybody had uh, any questions uh, with regards to um, this particular case. Uh, so I guess uh, my I will start with uh, uh, first question. So uh, most of the time. You know the approach is uh, starts with doing a transthoracic echo. So, uh, what is the first uh, signal to suspect a thrombus, uh, at least on echocardiographic signal? And do you? I mean, you may not see the thrombus right at the mouth. I mean, it may or may not be there. So, um, what? How would you suspect that? Right. And so you you really, I think um, you're not, you're right, you're not going to see the thrombus itself because what we usually see on echo will be the, can, the cannula, the inflow cannula itself, sort of at the apex of the LV, whereas the thrombus we're talking about is in the outflow graph that's attached, you know, uh, to the pump. And so you're, you're right, you're not going to see the clot itself, um, but you're going to see signs of poor unloading essentially of the LV, which includes sort of a dilated left ventricle. Um, you might notice that the septum is no longer midline, which is the goal for, for LVAD patients. You may notice like in this patient that the aortic valve is opening with every beat, whereas maybe it should only be opening once every three or four beats, um, sort of only periodically. So those are all kind of signs that the LV is not being properly unloaded. And so we, at that point, um, if you're seeing low flow alarms on the VAD as well, you know, that may be a time to consider, hmm, maybe we do need that CTA or additional imaging to kind of confirm whether there's a thrombus there. Yeah, essentially, uh, despite, uh, uh, you know, there being an LVAD, the LV is not going to be unloaded. So as you pointed out, uh, this, you also pointed out the sign that the aortic valve closure uh, and opening uh, is a, is a good indicator uh, how much you're able to unload the uh, left ventricle. Um, 
And uh, another question that I wanted to ask you was uh, with regards to uh, the CT, uh, are there any specific um, uh, steps to be done for performing CT in these subsets of patients? Uh, that I, I'm actually not too sure about. I, I think really the important part is just watching for that contrast going through. Uh, I don't know if there's really anything specific. It is just kind of a CT angiogram. Um, and really our focus is, is just sc scrolling through the, the CAT scan images until we can see that outflow graph sort of in, in its So entirety. how much amount of dye you could uh, use? What's the minimal amount of dye you can use to be able to visualize the graft? Uh, maybe this is a question that Dr. Um, Hey, Hamran, if he's uh, still here, can answer. Yes, man, given that renal function sometimes is a concern in these situations, what's the least amount of dye you can be able, uh, able to give to visualize the information? I mean, you know, you potentially could, uh, could do it with like uh, 40, 50 cc's of contrast. Um, you don't even need a gated study for this. You can just do a normal CT, CT angiogram. Uh, and uh, like Janet said, you just have to see if the contrast goes in through that outflow cannula or not, provided there aren't that many artifacts that are precluding adequate assessment of the of the lumen. But um, 40, 50 cc's, I won't go below that because then you won't have enough contrast to visualize it. And are there any specific um, um, steps in the uh, acquisition, as you mentioned? Um, I would say maybe you should go a little bit higher up um, to make sure you have the aorta, including the ascending aorta and maybe the arch portion uh, when you scan these patients. So um, I would say maybe use the cabbage protocol to, to include the aorta. Aside from that, just the normal CT chest. All right. Any other questions? Uh... I, I have a question. Um, the, the, this patient it has four years of the device. Uh, you suspected clinically that this was a graph occlusion. Is that right? Clinically, when the patient had a low cardiac output. Then uh, the next move was, uh, well, let's do some images. And you're going to recommend the first one would be an echo. What kind of view or what kind of echocardiogram would you ask for? Is anything special, given the suspicion that you had that this was a graph occlusion in the type of echo uh, or the views in the echo? So traditionally, a transthoracic echo, I think, will get you the information that you, you need in terms of sort of the, the LV size, the LV cavity size, the end diastolic diameter. Um, if you can get a good look at the aortic valve, of course, to, to visualize that it's opening. Um, you know, I think that is information that you, you know, should be able to get on the transthoracic. Now, TEE is something they, they can consider, I guess, if a patient has really poor windows and they really can't get good transthoracic imaging. Um, but generally, I think for most LVAD patients, even in routine follow-up, they still get transthoracic echoes. We don't send them for TEEs um, routinely, so. Yeah, so, the, uh, the, um, so we do have a specific LVAD protocol um, that we follow. Uh, in which we have to visualize the inflow and the outflow canal as much as possible. Uh, you can look into the uh, Doppler. You can put CW Dopplers at the inflow and try to see um, the uh, the velocities that you're able to capture. Uh, sometimes uh, it, it is possible if there's an inflow um, a can a cannula related issue. I mean, if you're if you have large velocity gradients that you're observing. Uh, these are all um, indication that there could be an inflow uh, obstruction. You can use also contrast, and sometimes the contrast can visualize the apices uh, to make sure that there are no clots that are sitting at the mouth of the inflow cannula. But most of the time, as Janet correctly pointed out, inside the cannula you cannot see. I mean that that is that is not visualized, and therefore obviously you will need. You'll have to depend upon indirect evidence of how the pump for performance, LVAT performance per se, and the whole uh, appearance of the left ventricle not being able to unload it. Um, so that will raise the clinical suspicion of them being some form of a pump failure, uh, LVAT failure. So uh, looking for uh, the CT scan would then be indicated. And and um, um, I guess, um, I'm, I was curious that 
how did uh, Janet in that particular case, you said that they they did not have to go on pump. Uh, they just did it. They just went um, directly to the Elvad cannula site and opened it up there and visualized the thrombus. So yeah, you... and I think it was very fortunate for this patient. I mean, it may not be that way really for, for everyone. Um, I, and so I think uh, he was just very lucky in that that thrombus, you know, they were able to see it right away and express it just using manual pressure. Um, uh, but like I said, it may not really be that case for, for other patients. So, you know, it, it was very quick. It was a very quick procedure for him and they were able to locate it and sort of treat it just, you know, within that 30 minutes. And also it's interesting, it didn't propagate and there was no systemic uh, embolism or anything else that happened in this patient, right? No, and and so the the thrombus um it it kind of sits outside of the graft, so it's not like it's traveling directly into the the through the aortic anastomosis into the aorta. It kind of sits outside that graft and within that casing that that a bend relief basically gets trapped in between. Okay, so I missed that point. Um, I, that I missed that point completely. So so yeah. this was completely outside, and there was an right. extrinsic compression of the. Right. This is the nice. compression. Now, is there any way to say 100% that there's no internal thrombus at all? Uh, it's hard to tell, I think, on a CT because it's it's really such a narrow, you know, sort of like uh, space between the two. But for this gentleman, it looked like it was mostly extrinsic. And once that, you know, thrombus came out, they noticed immediate flow improvement, you know, on, on his uh, LVAD. So. All right. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll have a change of guard now. And we will go to Alberto Batashai. So as uh, Alberto takes his time to come and join us, um, so Dr. Alberto Batashai is also one of our third year chief fellows. Uh, he uh, did his internal medicine uh, at George Washington University uh, and then uh, completed his uh, uh, residency and came here and uh, subsequent to his completion of cardiology fellowship program he going, is going to stay in New Jersey as our neighbor but he's chosen to go to Atlantic Health and uh, I will look forward to continuing to have interactions with him. So Alberto is going to present a case. Uh, uh, Alberto, floor is yours. Great, thank you so much for that introduction. <clears throat> so uh, I'm gonna be presenting a case um, regarding a intracoronary thrombolysis for rescue, rescue of refractory large thrombus burden. So to start off, our patient's a 38 year old male who presented with uh, chest pain uh, for the past one day. Um, he has a past medical history of uh, dyslipidemia. Uh, a few years ago, he had a gastric sleeve, and his family history is notable for a mother who had uh, a few pe pulmonary emboli, uh, as well as lupus. Uh, he currently is not on any medications. He's uh, treating his dyslipidemia with diet modification. Um, so initially, uh, patient's chest pain initially resolved. Uh, labs in the emergency room were pretty unremarkable. The normal hemoglobin hematocrit white blood cell count, uh, creatinine of just 1.0, and his initial troponin uh, T, high sensitivity, was 20, which was normal. Uh, three hours later, the repeat troponin slightly increased to 28, um, but still wasn't too significantly elevated. Um, and then by the early morning, uh, the troponin started to uh, greatly rise to 172, and then 433 uh, by the time he went to the cancer station. Uh, on physical exam, uh, it was pretty unremarkable. Uh, he had some sinus bradycardia, but otherwise uh, his cardiac exam was normal. Uh, lungs were cleared auscultation. His chest x-ray was normal. Uh, the EKG, as you, uh, ECG, as you can see here, uh, sinus rhythm. Uh, other ones were just sinus bradycardia with some sinus arrhythmia, but otherwise normal. Um, you can see maybe slight nonspecific uh, changes in the inferior uh, ST segments, but nothing that's you know, really too striking. Um, and, you know, the patient initially was chest pain free. Um, so you just medically managed, you started on a heparin drip, 
uh, started on dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and uh, ticagrelor. Um, and an echo was obtained. But during his echo, he started developing some chest pain. Uh, that last troponin uh, finally resulted at 400. So uh, he was rushed out of uh, the echo and into the catheterization lab. But the uh, read on the limited echo did show a normal EF without any significant regional wall motion abnormalities. Uh, so here's the coronary angiography. So I'm pointing mostly to the right side. So um, just one view and then. Just let it play and then we can talk about what we see. And then we also did uh, intravascular ultrasound, um, which, uh, as you can see, is obviously a very dilated uh, right coronary artery with a, a large uh, thrombus spur. Um, so again, I didn't show the left side, but it was normal left side circulation. There was no angiographically significant uh, stenosis. There was an ectatic RCA uh, on IVIS measured up to 7.5 millimeters in the proximal limit portion. Uh, it was about six millimeters in the distal RCA into the RPDA by IVIS. And as you know, you could see strikingly on the, the angiography, there was an acute thrombotic occlusion of the mid to distal RCA into the RPDA. Uh, so right now I'm just gonna quickly talk about uh, ectatic coronary arteries. So coronary artery ectasia is pretty rare, it happens about 2% of patients. Um, it's uh, localized coronary artery dilation that has to be one and a half times uh, the diameter of the largest vessel or of the normal adjacent segments. It's un of unclear etiology. It's thought to be congenital in about you know, 20 to 30% of patients. Um, and some important things about uh, you know, ectatic coronary arteries is that you can develop uh, thrombus formation resulting in acute coronary syndrome, uh, even without evidence of plaque, of any coronary plaque, let alone plaque rupture. Uh, and that's thought to be due to the slow coronary flows in the, um, you know, uh, outer parts of the wall, uh, the ectatic artery. Um, and, you know, many uh, people, when you get diagnosed with an ectatic coronary artery, will recommend antiplatelet therapy. And if they have a history of thrombosis, um, due to that, you know, slow coronary flow and, and ability to develop thrombi, um, patients are, you know, typically put on anticoagulation. But uh, as it's a rare disease, there's not much good... Uh, like randomized control data or any uh, guidelines that would uh, recommend that. So coronary artery thrombus, obviously we all know this, typically caused by plaque rupture, can be caused by embolism, and then as I just discussed, can be due to coronary artery dictation. Uh, so I know uh, Dr. Sandhouse already talked about it, but the, some of the management of coronary artery thrombosis. Um, as he said in the um, TAPAS trial back in 2008, there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm about routine uh, thrombectomy or at least thrombectomy in uh, patients of thrombus uh, resulting in STEMI. Um, it showed an improvement in myocardial blush uh, based on angiography. Um, but then further studies, uh, again, that Dr. Sand has touched upon today, um, really the, uh, for the total trial showed no improvement in cardiovascular death, shock, or class four heart failure or recurrent MI within uh, 180 days. Uh, despite improvement in ST segments and reduced distal embolization. They did find an increased risk of stroke. Uh, so that's why the uh, use of thrombectomy became a class three indication. So do not do for routine use. But uh, bailout thrombectomy is still a class 2B indication, um, you know, because there's just not enough evidence in, in that setting. Uh, so there's a 2B indication. Uh, different uh, approaches to thrombectomy. So there's simple catheter aspiration thrombectomy, which is when you the operator provides negative pressure uh, via syringe at the end of uh, the resulting in uh, aspiration. Uh, Um, sorry about that. Um, other than uh, simple catheter uh, thrombectomy, you could use mechanical thrombectomy, 
the uh, trade name is penumbra device, uh, which has a, you know, you attach the catheter to uh, a machine that provides negative pressure mechanically to provide uh, catheter aspiration. And then there's a rhyolytic thrombectomy catheter uh, known as AngioJet, it's marketed as AngioJet, which uses high speed uh, saline jet to create suction uh, by the Venturi effect and remove blood and thrombus uh, that way. Um, and then another option uh, when someone has refractory thrombus, a small study from Europe showed that there has been a benefit of intracoronary thrombolytics in patients who have refractory thrombus despite uh, PCI and, and thrombectomy. Uh, these patients typically were given either out of place or out of place, about one third of the normally given dose uh, for systemic administration. Um, all right, so case continued. Uh, initially, we underwent uh, PCI with a compliant balloon. There's still a uh, you know, significant thrombus burden. Uh, so mechanical thrombectomy with first uh, the export catheter um, and then the penumbra catheter to provide mechanical thrombectomy. But there was still persistent large thrombus burden. Uh, so the decision was made to give uh, 10 milligrams of intracoronary out of place, uh, let it percolate for a few minutes, uh, and then using the androjet mechanical aspiration system, uh, do some more thrombectomy. Um, once that was done, there was a significant reduction in the thrombus burden. Um, and, you know, repeat IVUS was uh, performed, showing, um, you know, significant improvement in the thrombus burden, but the, the um, RCA measured up to seven uh, millimeters, so standard coronary stents would not be able to fit. And the decision was made to not um, not place any stents. And I'll show uh, the final angiography. Um, of note, during the thrombectomy, he did develop some brief episodes of complete heart block requiring temporary TVP placement. So, as you can see here, I'm going to just play it again. Um, significant improvement in the thrombus uh, formation. You can see the RPDA a lot better, a lot more blood flow, but there's still some residual uh, distal thrombus that was not uh, able to be uh, completely removed. Um, so, um, and there was a TIMI2 flow at least in the distal uh, RPDA branch. The decision was made to manage with um, integralin and heparin for 24 or more hours uh, in the coronary care unit. Um, eventually, he was started on the switch from ticagrelor to clopidogrel, uh, continued on aspirin and started on coumadin um, for triple therapy for one month. Uh, and then the aspirin was stopped for just coumadin and plavix. Um, he was able to follow up uh, as an outpatient with the interventional cardiology team. Um, there was a workup done for any inflammatory conditions as they can be cause uh, of ectatic coronary arteries, as well as for hypercoagulable states due to his family history and the fact that he presents with thrombus at such an early age, though we note that the ectasia could have certainly precipitated it. But that workup was all negative. Uh, he's doing really well. Um, obviously, has no more chest pain. His INRs have been all therapeutic. Uh, and he needs to follow up. Uh, so thank you. So, very interesting case. Uh, uh, thank you for presenting that, Alberto. Um, my questions, um, as you were pointing out, is the underlying process. So uh, when you did the IVUS, uh, you saw only uh, thrombus. Did you see any form of plaques or any other signatures of uh, vascular lesions? No, there was no underlying plaque or uh... You know, internal thickening or anything. It's just a very dilated uh, artery. All right. And then um, second question is, um, I mean, you didn't see any markers of inflammation, but I felt like in your history, there was uh, some something in SLE or something. I was, uh, I missed that point. His mother had uh, lupus, so he was, lupus. Um, you know, inflammatory conditions certainly uh, cause ectatic coronary. So he was checked for that as well, but um, his ANA was only very mildly positive uh, when he followed up with rheumatology. Uh, and, and, and he was non-smoker or smoker? Uh, non-smoker. Non-smoker. Very, very interesting that there was almost no uh, specific um, items that you find here. Now, I'm, I'm still very intrigued, and uh, there would be a consideration to look into 
uh, the vascular architecture. And sometimes you can do that by, uh, I mean, you, I was did not show it, but you could go back and look at the vessel wall um, by doing uh, further analysis with CT. Um, and I wonder whether follow-up CT uh, would be of any utility. Uh, maybe this is again where I would invite Dr. Hamrani to uh, speak about uh, how you could uh, phenotype vessel wall pathology with CT. Yasmin, could you, uh, are you able to? Uh, I am driving. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, so I, yes, yes. I, uh, I'm sorry. So uh, in terms of uh, um, coronary ball, so um, again, uh, you have to make sure that the quality of CT images uh, should be really good. And it depends on the body habitus. If it's a, it's a thin patient and uh, you have um, a study with very less noise, uh, you can look at the uh, the the vessel wall very well. So CT definitely tells you um, vessel wall better than a coronary angiogram, which is just a luminography. So if you have good quality images, uh, then you uh, would be able to uh, look at it. Um, now there are those AI uh, packages now available that can better determine um, the 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 vessel. Pathology, but visually looking at it, you know, again, like I said, depends on the depends on the image quality. And then there is another um, the third technology. Yeah, go ahead. Someone is trying. There is another technology called as OCT, um, uh, and that can, that can have a very high resolution into the vessel wall uh, anatomy, uh, also, and that can uh, also be done in place of uh, IBIS. Anyone trying yes, to say uh, something? Yeah. I think because of the, um, you know, there's already a lot of dye given and you need more dye for the OCT. That's why we, we stuck with IBIS. Also to fill the whole coronary is like so dilated. I don't know if it would have been feasible to do a, a good um, OCT run uh, to, to fill the whole coronary with the uh, contrast. So um, it's a thought, you know, I think at some point we're thinking about re, uh, you know, doing the angiography again to just see how the, the vessel looked, um, you know, after the integral in for 24 hours, uh, but the patient kind of wanted to, to hold off on repeat catheterization, you know, he was doing well. And so we, uh, we agreed on holding off with catheterization, but yeah. potentially doing yeah. IVIS to just really get a, a good idea of what's going on in the underlying vessel wall. Yeah, you could get a CT and now, I mean, we do not have the technology, but I think we should think about it. Single photon CT uh, has a very, very high, resolution um, and it's going to soon be uh, around. And uh, this is something that we need to consider about new technologies to non-invasively assess uh, the coronary um, vessel wall uh, architecture. And, and that's going to be a future. And particularly there are now uh, AI algorithms which look into what is called as omics of the wall, also called as radiomics. And you can type uh, the different types of lesion. You can look into inflammation versus um, atherosclerosis, and you can follow patients up about pro with uh, progression or regression of vessel wall um, architecture. So these are another ideas uh, that we need to think about in these kind of cases because he's so young. Um, I really feel like we should try to phenotype uh, the underlying disease better to understand what's happening. Um, Obviously, the inflammatory markers were negative, but I still feel like there could be some nidus of inflammation that might be driving uh, that we are missing here. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? I, I have a question and a comment. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the left coronary artery was normal. Uh, there were no signs at all of any segmental ectasia or anything like that. It's very intriguing why one coronary will develop and the other one did. Um, that's uh, that's that that is a common. Another common is it's very rare that with such a dominant right coronary artery, the electrocardiogram was normal. And my third comment would be on the follow up. 
this patient is going to be for triple therapy. I don't think anyone knows for how long, one month, three months, six months. Um, it would be very interesting to repeat the coronary angiogram. I, I think it, CT coronary would be fine, but given the, 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 the disease may be to repeat the coronary angiogram, mainly to, to know how effective is the antiplatelet anticoagulation therapy is. That's all my comments. Well, thank you for the comments, Dr. Mara. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, this was grade three. There was absolutely nothing on the left side that showed any um, dilation or aneur aneurysm. Um, it was all on the right side, uh, as we saw. Um, and then in terms of how long the, uh, they should be on anti uh, antiplatelet and anticoagulants, I think Dr. Hermani also mentioned it in the chat. Um, he was on triple therapy for a month, and now he's kind of been maintained on uh, propertigrel and Coumadin. Um, I don't know how long that should go on for. Obviously, he's still going to have the nidus for thrombus formation, and he's shown a, a predilection for causing uh, thrombi. Um, potentially, maybe if we do a catheterization, we could decide to stop one or the other, either the antiplatelet or the, the Coumadin, or even transition the Coumadin to uh, DOAC, though I'm sure there's very little studies of that um, in this patient population. And uh, was there, uh, what was the uh, enzyme at, uh, peaking? And was there like uh, a large infarct or not an infarct? Yeah, so the, the first two enzymes were normal or, or barely above normal, and then it went up to the hundreds and up to the 400s. I think eventually in the CCU, it uh, never got trended out to peak, but um, it hit about 400 something, and uh, the repeat echo didn't show any regional wall motion abnormalities. I think what happened was that the thrombus initially uh, didn't completely occlude the artery, and that's why he was his chest pain had resolved, and his troponin didn't bump that much, but he was having a little bit of ischemia, and then eventually, as the thrombus propagated, despite being on anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy, um, it kind of jumped up a little bit higher while we took him originally to catheterization. Yeah, maybe a little bit excessive, but I would, I mean, be interested also to see if there was any infarct, and I, I would do a CMR. I guess these are all things we can do now, but look, this is a young guy to see how much infarct size he has, um, how much uh, is at risk. I mean, these are all important questions for a, a patient like him. Uh, yeah, so to, uh, to I, I would I would not be worried to study him more in depth um, with any of those imaging methods, invasive necessary, but certainly I worry, I seem, uh, very worried, not understanding what is going on, and uh, and and not be able to decide how long the anticoagulation needs to last. So these are very challenging cases, uh, and uh, I, I still feel very worried that he may come back. Uh, and there is any question that are coming? Um, were there any? Sasha is asking were there any aneurysms elsewhere in any other territories, aorta, kidney, brains. Um, I don't think he was evaluated for other aneurysms. Yeah, so I think there will be important uh, for us to understand how systemic the disease is phenotyping the patient will be great uh, need. Very challenging, very important, uh, and uh, all the best. I think you will get a lot of questions. I, I am hoping this would have prepared you for your uh, sessions at ACC. And uh, thank you, everyone. So if you're coming there, please uh, come and note all the presentations there are. Close to about 59 presentations from the health system of which 26 are being presented by our faculty and fellows uh, and also uh, uh, our sonographers are presenting. So uh, first of all, congratulations and we look forward to seeing you all in ACC at Atlanta. Thank you very much for that. Goodbye.